Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those out, out there on the internet. Uh, very pleased to, on behalf of Synetics Medical and the Jin Shan Chongqing Science and Technology Group to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, just waiting for people to log in. We've actually got uh, 200 people have registered for today's event from 26 countries, from Venezuela to uh, China to Australia. So people from all over the world, we're very pleased. Please bear in mind that today's webinar will be recorded and will be available uh, for download on the uh, internet. Uh, in, with regards to uh, questions, if you do have questions that you would like to ask Prof Sifrim, please type them into the group chat and then Tracy Fitzsimmons or myself will ask Professor the questions at the end of the webinar. So do feel free to pose questions, but uh, during the uh, webinar, the microphones will be muted and we would like, uh, we will do the questions and answers at uh, the end. So without further ado, on behalf of the Synetics Medical and the Chongqing Jinshan Science and Technology Group, I would like to welcome Professor Daniel Sifrim, the world-renowned expert in this field, to begin his presentation. Good morning, Prof. Good morning to you and um, good afternoon or good evening to the rest of the people participating. Uh, today, I would like to initially discuss with you the different methodologies for diagnosis of reflux disease and particularly the advantages of measuring impedance pH metry uh, during ambulatory reflux monitoring. So there are several techniques for diagnosis of reflux disease starting with a good questionnaire of course, endoscopy, biopsies, uh, barium swallow. Um, there are more uh, new endoscopic techniques. Um, and most classically, uh, there is a measurement of reflux during ambulatory monitoring. And this can be performed either as a pH metry, uh, both uh, catheter based or wireless or a catheter-based uh, pH impedance metric. So today we are going to focus on the ambulatory reflux monitoring and particularly on pH impedance. Now, the catheter-based uh, methodology involves the swallowing of a catheter that can contain several pH sensors and impedance um, recording segments um, or it can be measured with a capsule in a wireless way. The idea of these techniques is to measure several parameters. One is the esophageal acid exposure. Another is the number of acid and non-acid reflux events. It is important to identify the reflux events and the symptoms to calculate the symptom association analysis, such as symptom index and symptom association mm. probability. Webinar started new, with about 60 attendees. There are two new um, impedance parameters that I will explain in detail later. One is the assessment of the mucosal integrity using the mean nocturnal baseline impedance and the other is to assess the clearance characteristics after a reflux episode and the parameter is called post reflux swallow induced peristaltic wave or PSPW. With the technique that I am going to discuss we can also evaluate um, the presence of gas in the refluxate and we can also evaluate the possibility of uh, rumination. Now the whole 
idea of um, measuring reflux is to identify first whether the patient has reflux disease or not and second to see what phenotype um, is the patient we are trying to um, diagnose. Is it a patient with non-erosive reflux disease? Is it a patient with esophageal hypersensitivity? Or the patient has functional heartburn? Additionally, now we are able to study in detail the presence and consequences of aerophagia and also uh, the distinction between different types of belching and trying to identify the so-called supragastric belches that require a very specific treatment. So let's talk about ambulatory reflux monitoring with uh, impedance pH metric. This is a typical ambulatory recorder and you can see on the right an impedance tracing that involves six impedance channels along the esophageal body, one pH channel in green in the esophagus at six, five centimeters above the lower esophageal sphincter, and in this case another pH sensor located in the stomach. For those that are not very familiar with the concept of impedance, I would like to simply describe it. The catheter contains several impedance sensors, and when the liquid or food bolus is moving uh, in the esophagus, for example, in a swallow like this, the impedance drops and I'm sorry for that. The impedance uh, drops, and uh, what we can see is a drop, a progressive drop in impedance, like this. You can see that the drop starts in the upper part of the uh, tracing, suggesting this is proximal, and moves down to the distal part of the esophagus. This is how impedance detects a swallow. In contrast, if the liquid is moving the other way around, like in this case, there is liquid moving upwards as a reflux episode, we see the same drop in impedance, but unlike the swallow, the drop moves in a proximal direction, starts in the distal esophagus and moves upwards. This is the difference between a swallow detected by impedance and a reflux detected by impedance. Now, the combination of impedance and pH metry allows to identify reflux using impedance, like here, here, or there, and characterize the refluxate in terms of acidity using the pH sensors. This is a reflux episode detected by impedance that is acid, because the pH drops below 4. In contrast, this is a reflux episode detected by impedance where the pH drops above 4 and is called weakly acidic. And in this case, there is an impedance detected reflux. The pH either doesn't drop or even go, can go slightly up. And this is what we call alkaline reflux and being the combination of weakly acidic and alkaline reflux, what we now call non-acid reflux. Now what are the advantages of impedance pH monitoring compared to pH metry? I will discuss these six different issues. Impedance is useful to exclude artifacts, to detect non-acid reflux events, to characterize air or gas movements in terms of aerophagia or belching, provides information about the mucosal integrity and provides information about the clearance phenomenon through the uh, PSPW parameter. Finally, more recently, we managed to 
um, describe a pattern of impedance pH metry typical of a rumination syndrome. Let's go one by one. Exclude artifacts. This is a pH tracing, and you can see in this pH tracing that there are pH drops below 4, 1, 2, 3 here. These uh, pH drops are considered in the analysis for the um, measurement of the total acid exposure time. However, if we look at the impedance tracings that are uh, related to these pH drops, we can see that every time that there is a pH drop, there are like spikes in the impedance tracing. Very fast increases in impedance rather than drops as we see in normal swallows or liquid reflux like this. So you can interpret this that in fact, these pH drops are the consequence of belch-related acid reflux episodes. However, in this particular case, if we expand more the tracing and look at one of these pH drops, we can see that, in fact, during that period, there are multiple swallows with drops in impedance moving antegrade with some air as well. So, we now know that in this case, the patient was drinking a fizzy drink, in this case was Coca-Cola, that provoked the spikes and the pH drop. So impedance is able to tell us whether the pH drops are genuine acid reflux episodes or are the consequence of artifacts or drinking. And this is something that the pH monitoring cannot tell us. What about detection of non-acid reflux events? Now we know that non-acid reflux episodes occur very commonly in patients that are studied on PPIs because they are uh, refractory to PPI treatment. In this context, patients with symptoms that are not responding to PPIs may have those symptoms due to non-acid reflux. And mainly the symptoms occurring due to non-acid reflux are heartburn and re mainly regurgitation and sometimes even chest pain. Now, pH metry cannot detect non-acid reflux related symptoms. Even more important is to know that there is um, a possibility that the patients have hypersensitivity to non-acid reflux. You know that from 100 patients that you perform an endoscopy, 35% will have a pathological endoscopy either showing esophagitis or complications such as stenosis or Barrett's. The other 65% is conform what we call non-acid reflux, uh, non-erosive reflux disease. In that group, the majority are what we call true non-erosive reflux disease. These patients have increased acid exposure and they are easily identified. However, there is a population of patients where the acid exposure is normal and they have symptoms associated to reflux episodes, either to acid or to non-acid reflux episodes. These are patients that have esophageal hypersensitivity to non-acid reflux events and the only way to detect these patients is doing impedance pH metry. Even more important is the reflux measurement in pediatrics, particularly in neonates. We now know that neonates have very often regurgitation after the feeding. And because this regurgitation is mostly the milk that they are 
receiving, most of these regurgitations are non-acidic. So in neonates and in pediatrics, non-acid reflux is very common and it can be the basis for some bronchial aspiration and pneumonia or respiratory disorders in small children. Therefore, the detection of non-acid reflux by impedance is important in understanding patients that are refractory to PPIs in the distinction between different phenotypes of reflux disease, for example, between functional heartburn and NERF, and particularly important in pediatric patients, especially in neonates. What about aerophagia and belching? This is an impedance tracing with the six channels of impedance, one esophageal pH and one gastric pH. You can see that in these two periods, the patient was at the meal times. And we can see that during the meal periods, they have enormous amount of spikes. Not much in between the meals, as you can see here. So that means that the patient is swallowing a lot of air during the meals. This is what we call aerophagia. Aerophagia is a Greek word that describes swallowing of air. Interestingly, these patients had at that time refractory uh, to PPI uh, as a group, and there was another group that were responders to PPIs. And we identify a subgroup of patients that were refractory to PPIs that had this phenomenon. In other words, these patients had significant aerophagia during the meals, followed by belch-related acid reflux because they had this enormous amount of gas in the stomach. As you can imagine, this belch-related acid reflux sometimes cannot be managed by PPI, and that is why these patients were refractory to treatment. The treatment of this is the treatment of the aerophagia. It is difficult to manage, but it consists of dietary restrictions and some modifications in the position of the plate relative to the mouth. Now, as I said, the liquid movement in the esophagus involves a drop in impedance. But when we see a rise in impedance, like here, we are in the presence of air movement. Air provokes an increase in impedance, and liquid provokes a drop in impedance. Now, if we are able to follow the timing of the increase in impedance, we can see that the timing is earlier in the distal channel and goes and moves up to the proximal channel. So this is air moving from the stomach upwards into the esophagus. And this is associated by liquid movement also from the lower part up to the upper part. And you can notice here that there is a small decrease in pH. So this is a gastric belch, meaning that the belch is coming from the stomach and is associated to acid reflux, as you can see by the arrows. Now, if we analyze this situation, you will see that it is different. The impedance rises, starts in the upper part, and moves downwards. And this is also associated with liquid movement in the reflux direction. This is a special type of air movement called supragastric belching. Supragastric belching is a behavioral phenomenon that implies an abrupt drop of the diaphragm, intrathoracic negative pressure, sucking of air inside the esophagus, and movement of air from the throat into the esophagus eliminated by straining. This is a behavioral disorder that affects many people and we are finding this more and more often and we believe that it can be also a reason of 
refractory ms to ppi treatment this is an example of a supragastric belching associated with acid reflux as you can see here of course you cannot detect this with ph meter so MIIPH or multi-channel impedance recordings can detect movements of air and gas and depending on the direction this can be aerophagia, gastric belching or supragastric belching. The measurement of these uh, parameters helps to um, assess the pathophysiology of reflux uh, associated to this type of belching and we can also detect the frequency of belching and measure it and use this as a parameter for follow-up uh, during and after treatment. Now, impedance can also give us an idea of the status of the mucosa. Now, if you see this is an impedance tracing and these are swallows. In between the swallows, the impedance is pretty stable. Impedance values are measured in ohms. It's a, it's a measure of electrical resistance impedance. Now, if the mucosa is intact and normal, the impedance in a healthy subject is around 3000 ohms. However, if the mucosa is damaged, there is a leaky situation where ions are moving across the mucosa and that makes the conductivity of electricity very good, meaning the opposite of impedance. That means that when the mucosa is damaged, the impedance baseline is low. When the mucosa is normal, the impedance baseline is high. So when you compare the baseline impedance between controls where the impedance baseline is around 3000 ohms and patients with esophagitis, you can see that there is a very important difference. Patients with esophagitis have a baseline impedance below 1500 ohms, and patients with um, non erosive reflux disease may have values between 2000 and 1500. So the baseline impedance is telling us the severity of the damage of the mucosa. So a low baseline impedance indicates mucosal damage and it is also very interesting to know that there is an association between the degree or severity of the mucosal baseline impedance drop and the sensitivity to acid. The patients with low baseline impedance are more sensitive to acid. Now, let me show you what is this PSPW, or post-reflux swallow-induced peristaltic wave. This is an impedance tracing that is showing a reflux episode associated with a pH drop. So this is a liquid acid reflux event. And you can see that immediately after that, within 20 or 30 seconds, there is a downwards movement of liquid detected by impedance which is associated with a correction of the pH. So what is this? This is a swallow that brings saliva rich in bicarbonate and that saliva rich in bicarbonate neutralizes the acidity of the mucosa. This is a reflex. The reflex is triggered by the reflux. And this reflex is normal. It's normal in children, it's normal in adults, it's normal in old people. Healthy subjects have this reflex in almost every reflux event, physiological reflux event. However, in patients with reflux disease, this reflex doesn't work very well. It fails. And the PSPW score is low. Therefore, the use of the PSPW as a parameter became very interesting because it's present 
when it is no normal, is good in healthy subject, and when it is abnormal, it gives an indication that the patient might have reflux disease, and also it has a predictive value of response to treatment. Patients with low PSPW respond better to PPI treatment than patients with normal PSPW. And these uh, two indexes, the MNBI and the PSPW, have pretty good sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of non-erosive reflux disease, particularly in patients that have an inconclusive diagnosis of reflux disease based on the Lyon consensus parameters. So PSPW and MNBI are new parameters detected by impedance that you cannot get with pH metry, and they can increase the diagnostic yield in patients with inconclusive diagnosis of reflux disease. Finally, let me talk to you about the possibility of diagnosis of rumination syndrome. Now, rumination syndrome, um, rumination syndrome is a behavioral disorder in which the patients have uh, regurgitation, effortless regurgitation after the meals. Now, until a few years ago, the diagnosis of rumination was a clinical diagnosis defined by ROM4 criteria as effortless regurgitations in young patients after the meals. The confirmation of the diagnosis is currently performed using the combination of high-resolution manometry and impedance uh, with a measurement after a meal uh, that detects these uh, episodes of abdominal straining and liquid retrograde flow followed by a swallow and clearance of the esophagus in the high-resolution manometry and uh, impedance. So we wanted to know if in patients with a clear-cut diagnosis of rumination based on the clinics and the high-resolution manometry have a particular pattern in the reflux monitoring, just in the reflux monitoring with impedance pH metry. So this is a tracing, and you can see this black bar shows the um, meal period. So you can see that after the meal period, the patient had several, each of these yellows is one non-acidic reflux episode. It's non-acidic, you can see that the pH doesn't drop below four. And more interesting is that the patient marked as a symptom the presence of that regurgitation. So the, the idea is that these patients have significant number of non-acidic reflux episodes that are symptomatic. These two things constitute this uh, new pattern of rumination. You can see here, this is a 30 minutes period, and in 30 minutes, the patient had like eight uh, regurgitation episodes, symptomatic. You can see it in an amplified um, scale that these are liquid reflux events, symptomatic, that are non-acidic. So this is a new possibility that allows uh, the use of MIIPH for diagnosis of rumination syndrome, particularly in patients that are um, assessed for what is called refractory reflux disease. These are young patients that have persistent regurgitation after um, the meals in spite of a high dose of PPIs. A significant number of these patients actually don't have reflux disease. They have a psychological behavioral disorder called rumination syndrome. So, as I said, uh, there are indications for uh, impedance pH monitoring that now are becoming more and more clear to us. To exclude artifacts, to detect non-acid reflux, to assess air and gas movements, to look at the mucosal integrity, to assess clearance of reflux, and to diagnose rumination syndrome. I would like to clarify that at this moment, the two most common techniques used for reflux monitoring are wireless pH metry and catheter-based impedance pH monitoring. They are not enemies to each other. They are 
complementary tests. In patients with typical heartburn without any of these uh, problems like aerophasia or uh, refractoriness, wireless pH metry is more than enough to make diagnosis of reflux disease. In patients with suspicious of rumination or where the symptoms are associated with gas or belching or they are not responding well to PPIs, the use of impedance pH metry is more interesting. So the combination of the two techniques should be used in a clever way in each specific patient. So with this, I finished the presentation that I wanted to do as a kind of introduction of the um, impedance uh, pH metry. Um, and um, what we are going to do now is to move to real life traces. I would like to discuss with you and to show you how we analyze in our lab the impedance pH metry uh, traces. So, Uh, just while Prof's bringing up the uh, live, the tracings, uh, just to remind everybody, if you do have any questions, please type them into the Q&A uh, panel, and uh, we will attempt to answer those questions at the end of the uh, presentation. Can you see the... Uh, not yet, Prof. Uh, so you share, share, you need to share your screen. Yeah. One second, please. Then. Yes. Right. Can you see it now? Uh, that's it, Prof. We can see the first tracing. Thank you. Okay. So for those that are not familiar with uh, um, reflux monitoring with impedance pH metry, I will just show you what are we looking at. This is a study of a patient. The patient has a reflux symptoms, and you can see these six upper tracings are impedance recordings. The green is a pH recording measured at five centimeters above the lower esophageal sphincter, and the red is a gastric pH recording. Um, and as you can see, the uh, pH in the esophagus uh, in baseline is around six to seven, and in the stomach is between one and two. On top of the recordings, you can see two types of markers. The upper part is telling us when the patient is in supine position, this light blue period, whereas the pink parts are the periods that the patient marked where he is supposed to have meals. And it is important for us to know whether the uh, marking of the patient is correct or not. So the first thing that I am doing when I am ana analyzing one of these tracings is to see if there are general artifacts in the impedance channels or in the PA channels. And I can see that in this particular case, there are no artifacts. The next step is to check whether the markings that the patient made after following the instructions are correct or not. And this is very important, and I would like to spend a few minutes with you doing this. Let's start with the meals. This is the first period of meals, so what I am doing is I am opening that part to see if this is correct. So you can see that the patient marked a short meal here and a little bit later, a more, more meal. There are two things that are very important to recognize that the meal periods are correct. The first is that during the meals, the impedance of the last channel has a pronounced drop, always, almost touching the black line of the frame. And this is very helpful to know where is the real meal period. 
and the other is the increase in gastric pH. The patient is drinking or eating something that increases the gastric pH above the pH 1 or 2. So I have no doubt that this is a drink or a meal and that the timing that the patient put here is correct because the impedance dropped here and because of the increase in pH. Thereafter, the patient continue and you can see that the frequency of swallowing is much higher than the frequency of swallowing after or before the meal. So the frequency of swallows gives you an idea of the presence of the meal period. However, in this case, the patient, if I amplify this measurement, you can see that first, the patient started the meal a little bit earlier there and finishes the meal significantly earlier, but he forgot to push the marker. So I need to correct this and make sure that the meal period is correct. The reason being that the software analysis is set it up in a way that reflux episodes occurring during the meal are not included in the calculation of the esophageal acid exposure. So I, that, I did this with the first meal, second, and then I continue doing that with the next meals. I go here to the next meal. And here, the situation is similar. The patient started by drinking something uh, with a very high frequency, and then he, he says that he finished the meal here. However, you can see that the drinking, the frequency you know, is not that high. But if I compare the frequency of swallowing here with the frequency of swallowing there, I accept that in fact the patient is eating all during this time and therefore the meal period this is correct. Then I go to the next. Here, interestingly, he had another short meal period, but he didn't mark it. So I need to correct this because there is a pH drop here. So I have to select this period and I have to add an event, which is I need to, I need to try to, in a way, say that I need to uh, consider this as a meal time. So I will go back to the, I will put like this, sorry. And this is now considered a meal and the program will identify this as a meal and will not consider the pH in that way. So I go on and the patient here has another meal which I think is correct and the patient has the supine period, another supine part of the supine period and then I go to the end of the tracing and I, I identify another meal, you can see that the impedance in the last channel drops and the gastric pH goes up. And then I arrive to the end of the tracing. So I go back to the whole tracing. I now know that the meal periods are correct. However, I find here that there is a um, supine marking that is not correct. The patient was awake. This is at the beginning of the study. Maybe he pushed wrongly one of the markers. So I need to get rid of that. Otherwise, this will be added to the rest of the supine period. So I just simply click there and delete it. The next step is to um, look at the baseline impedance.
the baseline impedance is measured during the supine period when the patient is sleeping. The way to do that is to use the ruler and once you have the ruler, you select the supine period and you read the values that you have here. In the channel 6, the mean value is 1439, 1764, 1749. So the impedance values were around 1500 and this is normal in our uh, experience. There is some discussion about cutoffs of baseline impedance. The Italian group suggested more than 2000. In our hands, after a very large multi-center international uh, study that we published in GUT two years ago, we know that normal subjects, um, the cutoff is around 1500. So when it is clearly below 1500, we say that the baseline impedance is low. And finally, another thing that I am always very interested in checking and editing is the symptoms. In this tracing, every vertical line, as you can see here, is a symptom marked by the patient. Now, if you know that the reflux symptom association analysis is based on the accuracy of reflux detection, it should also be based on accuracy of symptoms description. Now, let me show you how do we check that. In this particular situation, the patient marked many symptoms after the meal. Now, let's increase this. So this is a, this time here is 10 minutes. So if I look at this, you can see that these are, there are almost three minutes in between one symptom and the other. That is plausible the patient may have had symptom one here and heartburn there. But many times the patient pushes twice immediately at the same time. And what it does, it, it is in a way, it creates a situation like this, that the two symptoms are very close to each other. And then you have to delete the second one. Why? Because that will interfere with the accuracy of the reflux symptom association analysis. So once I have edited the um, meal period, I have corrected the supine period, I have checked the baseline impedance, and I have edited the symptoms, I am ready for the automatic analysis of this impedance tracing. So we will go to the automatic analysis of this impedance tracing. It takes around one minute to be performed the whole automatic analysis. Okay, so the automatic analysis identify acid by marking by yellow. Of course, the stomach is acid all the time, and that is why you have this yellow bar in the stomach. But the vertical little yellow bars are the reflux detected by the automatic analysis. Now, I mentioned that I very at the very beginning of my analysis, I wanted to know whether the patient had normal baseline impedance or not. And why I wanted to know that at the very beginning? Because we know that when the baseline impedance is normal, above 1500, the 
software analysis is much more reliable and the reflux detection is easier for the software analysis. In contrast, when the baseline impedance is low, the software is having problems to identify reflux events because it cannot uh, detect accurately the drop in impedance progressing from the distal to the proximal part because the impedance baseline is very low. So in this particular case, the impedance baseline is normal and therefore I think that the um, um, automatic analysis is pretty good. However, we used to edit manually all the tracings. We go one by one and look whether the software did a good job or not. Why? Because many times the software is over-diagnosing reflux episodes and that can make problems for the a the understanding of the association the the total acid exposure and for the understanding of the reflux symptom association and the counting of the total number of reflux events these are parameters that are normally used for diagnosis of reflux disease so let's have a look how this um, time the software did the analysis so we put it into a time window of five minutes and you can see the individual swallows then the software has a system that takes you to what you want in this case takes you to the reflux episode and we are going to go to the first so this is the first reflux episode detected by the software and indeed this is different from that which is a swallow but I want to know what is this, because I see first an increase in impedance and then a decrease in impedance. So in order to know what is this, I open this and I check. And you can see that there is air moving. Now, is this a gastric belch or a supragastric belch associated with liquid moving up and a pH drop? In order to know that, I put a cursor and I try to move the cursor to see what happens in time. And you can see that this channel went up earlier than the more proximal. So this is a gastric belch associated with liquid reflux. I go back to my previous view and I go to the next reflux episode. This is okay, there is a liquid coming up and there is a pH drop. This is an acid reflux event. I go to the next. This is again a belch related reflux. I want to know whether it is gastric or not. Again, I use my cursor and I maybe it's better to amplify it even farther. And I use the cursor and I put it there. And again, I can see that the distal channel impedance went up before the proximal, confirming the idea that this is a gastric belch. So, so far, two reflux episodes associated with a gastric belch. This is obvious, it's another reflux episode associated with a belch. We can have a look, and it is definitely obvious. I don't need the cursor to say that this is a gastric belch. So, this patient has predominantly gastric belches. And I say this because in general, the patients have a pretty homogeneous pattern. Either they have most of the belches gastric or they have most of the belches non um, supra gastric. So let's continue to look at the rest of the episodes. These are all reflux episodes well diagnosed by the software. As I said, when the baseline impedance is good, the software behaves well. However, here there is a little problem. And you can see that the software thinks that this is a reflux episode. However, if you look at this, it's identical to that. So this is a swallow. A swallow that was misdiagnosed by the software in, that interpreted that this was reflux. So I increase a little the amplitude. I put the right mouse button and I delete this. And I go back to my analysis. So this is the way we analyze. We accept reflux 
detected by automatic analysis or we delete them if we disagree. I agree with this, I agree with this, I agree with this. This is with uh, gas before, is another belch with liquid reflux and is another gastric belch. And I go through the whole tracing and I accept or delete the majority of reflux episodes. This is again okay. Now here there is something interesting. There is a swallow and then after the swallow there is a retrograde flow. So this is a reflux episode which is associated with a pH drop. Now interestingly there is a swallow here that is correcting the pH. So this is what we call a PSPW. This this um, sorry this um, swallow here is a typical example of a PSPW. And this is another reflux, another reflux, and so on we go through. Here there is a little problem. The program interpreted that this reflux episode started with this gas here and liquid movement here with that pH drop. However, there is a significant pH drop preceding that. I believe that this reflux episode started much earlier, started there, and probably there, and probably there. So we can edit and improve the performance of the automatic analysis. And then we go to the next, and to the next, and so on. At the end of the editing, you are ready to ask for the report. The report will tell you all the parameters that you want to know. So you go to the report. And you can ask or you can decide what parameters you want to have in your report and you can click here on the left side. What are you interested in? Well, I am interested in the following patterns. I am interested in acid exposure. I am interested in the, the Mr. score. I want to know how many reflux episodes were and what type of reflux. I'm not very interested in the bolus clearance time or bolus exposure time. I am interested in the MNBI. I must say that the PSPW index I prefer to calculate it manually because the PSPW is very much dependent on um, the identification correctly of the reflux episode and the timing between the swallow and the reflux episode and the software so far are not that accurate for that. I'm not interested in the postprandial analysis in general, and I am interested in the correlation between reflux as symptoms to know the symptom index and the symptom association probability. So this is what I'm going to see in the report. As you can see, this patient has a total acid exposure of 6, upright acid exposure 10.4, and supine acid exposure 1.3. I need to uh, actualize the um, report cutoff values. Now we accept the Leon consensus cutoff values of 6 rather than 4.2. So the new values that are accepted as a cutoff for normality are 6. And definitely this patient has total acid exposure of 6 and clear cut pathological upright reflux. Now, a part of this, I want to know the total number of reflux episodes. The total number was 39. In the past, I used as a cutoff 73 based on studies that we did very initially at the very beginning of the use of impedance. But now we know that the number of reflux episodes, correct cutoff, is around 50. When a patient has 
less than 50 reflux episodes, we believe that this is pretty normal. And you can see that the values of the MNBI is pretty normal. In the channel 6 is at the border. However, uh, I can interpret this, that this is a very light touch in the mucosa. The patient has pathological acid exposure. So it is possible that in this patient, the baseline impedance of the very distal esophagus is slightly low. And then I look at the symptoms. You see that the patient marked four times heartburn, of which three were related to reflux, and that gives a symptom index of 75% and a symptom association probability of 99.9% .9 for heartburn. Belches I never use for symptom association analysis. I don't think that this is correct. And symptom one, the patient had 16 events. I cannot remember what was symptom one in this patient, but the patient had 16 times of which nine were not related. Therefore, the symptom index was negative, is less than 50%, and the SAP was also negative, 80%. So for this patient, my diagnosis is that the patient has a pathological acid exposure that has um, mainly uh, uh, upright pathological acid exposure with a positive reflux symptom association with heartburn. So this is uh, the way we usually analyze uh, multi-channel impedance tracings. As a summary, I can tell you that we, it's very important to check the quality of the study, the marking of the patient, the baseline impedance, and to edit the reflux episodes according to what you believe that is real reflux or not. I would like to show you a couple of other examples um, to just have a look at um, a couple of things that I mentioned earlier today. This is another tracing that I will open now. And what I would like to show you is this last meal period here. If I open this, you can see that the patient has very important aerophagia during that meal. The consequence of that is, if you see what happens in the postprandial period, is that the patient has belch related acid reflux the first you can see these two all gastric belch related acid reflux let's continue you can see all the ph drops here are related to belches so in this particular patient the um, aerophagia during meal is provoking postprandial belch related acid reflux and you need to address that and in your report you need to consider the possibility that the main problem of this patient is aerophagia another tracing i would like to share with you today is something different so the first thing that you observe here is that the baseline impedance during the supine period is very low, particularly in the last two channels. Now, if you want, we can have a look at the numbers. We can measure this. And you see that in the last, in the channel six is 483, and in the channel five is 729, in the channel four is 1093, and only in the channel three is normal. So the last three channels have a very low baseline impedance. But you can also see that there is an important acid 
pH drop at the very beginning of the supine period. So if you look at this in detail, sorry, we need to get rid of this. If we look at this in detail, you can say, all right, the patient had a significant liquid belch-related acid reflux event that was because the patient was deeply asleep without any swallow until here uh, means that the clearance of that liquid never happened and the low baseline impedance can be due either to a mucosal damage like we observe in patients with esophagitis or can also be due to uh, the presence of liquid but in my opinion it's very unlikely that the presence of liquid would reach such a high level in the esophagus so therefore i believe that this patient has a severe damage of the mucosal integrity just based on the baseline impedance and a final example that i would like to share with you is another situation for which impedance can be very useful and i did not mention this earlier during my presentation so what is clear in this tracing is that the baseline impedance in the supine period is absolutely low in all the channels up to the upper channel if you measure this baseline impedance you will see that the values are 458, 444, 445, 423, 546, 736. So this situation of very low baseline impedance all over the esophagus is very typical, I would say patognomonic, of the presence of eosinophilic esophagitis. Eosinophilic esophagitis provokes a change in the mucosa that provokes a very low baseline impedance. And that happens all over the esophagus, and this has been published several times now, and is patognomonic of eosinophilic esophagitis. This is a different situation from the previous one in which there was acid reflux. Here there is no acid. The mucosa is damaged all over, and we can diagnose this with impedance pH. And with this, I will finish my presentation of today and i really would appreciate and would be very happy to answer your questions uh thank you very much prof uh, there are about eight questions so far and we'd encourage if anyone else has any questions to put them in the q a uh, uh chat the first question prof was about aerophasia what is the criteria for aerophasia i.e how many spikes do you need to have it to be diagnosed as aerophasia? There is no real number. What makes diagnosis of aerophasia is the fact that the spike is observed in all the channels, from the proximal to the very distal channel impedance. And when we see that there is very, it is very frequent, more than five, between five and 10 swallows with aerophasia during the meal, that for us is enough to make diagnosis. The most important is that it's not just one spike in one or two channels, it's that it is all over. Uh, Tracy, is there a question? Yeah, and we have another question, yes, sir. Um, is there a link between PSPW successfully neutralizing acid pH or failing to neutralize acid pH against the DCI found in peristalsis? Well, theoretically is, if a patient has ineffective esophageal motility with very low DCI, it can be that the PSPW fails and it doesn't work. And there is some studies from Dr. Prakash Giawali uh, together with uh, the Italian group that somehow shows that there is a correlation between the efficiency of the motility and the PSPW. So patients with severe uh, ineffective esophageal motility have a very poor uh, 
uh, PSPW. Thanks, Prof. Uh, another question regarding aerophasia is, what are your treatment strategies for patients with aerophasia and patients with supergastric belching? Well, the, the strategies are a little bit long to describe, but in, in general, I would say that for aerophasia, we um, indicate a complete restriction of liquids and definitely fizzy drinks during the meals, completely abolished. And we have a technique that uh, implies a position of the head relative to the position of the plate. In normal times, we normally eat with a plate on the table and we put the head down and we bring the food to your mouth. That makes that the head is a little bit inclined and that favors air swallowing. In contrast, if you bring the plate up and you keep the head up and you bring the food to your mouth, very much like Asian people is doing, mm. you eat noodles or other food, that reduces the amount of air swallowing. This is concerning aerophasia. Concerning supragastric belching, that requires a full uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that involves uh, diaphragmatic breathing and a very special position of the tongue relative to the teeth. Okay, another question, Prof. Um, in your experience, does probe, probe discomfort in the throat lead to artifactual aerophagia in some patients? And how do you determine what is artifactual and what is pathological? Well, this is very difficult to know. I must say that it is true that the presence of the catheter might um, provoke um, artificial aerophasia. But in general, in my experience, this is not very common. In general, they have true aerophasia. Uh, there is no other way to measure aerophasia uh, without the catheter during a prolonged period. So I cannot detect aerophasia without catheter in. Uh, thanks, Prof. Uh, there was a question about the first case, which was patient BB. And the question was, why did you extend the meal period? Uh, as this could have easily been immediately acid reflux after the meal. Not sure if that's clear. That was for the first patient, which was patient BB. Well, I, I normally use the swallow frequency to detected by impedance to have an idea of the um, duration of the meal. And I compare the swallow frequency with the periods later or before. If a patient has a very low swallow frequency and all of a sudden is swallowing much frequently, I assume that this is due to the meal. And that is why I made it longer. Right. Okay, uh, next question. What is the significance of the Demister score? Well, the Demister score was developed by uh, Dr. Tom Demister, who is a very prestigious surgeon in the US many years ago. And the Demister score included uh, several variants of pH metry. Uh, it is very much uh, used by surgeons because they feel uh, some kind of solidarity with the inventor of the of the score, but in my uh, opinion, there is an extremely good correlation between the Demister score and the esophageal acid exposure. So, if the esophageal acid exposure is normal, to me is enough. I don't mind about the Demister score. I think that the esophageal acid ex exposure is a much more in, a strong parameter. Uh Thanks, Prof. There were a couple of questions about the baseline impedance when it is low. So if the baseline impedance is low and we don't trust the automatic analysis, what is the best way to analyze acid exposure and impedance then? I don't understand the question. So, uh, so the question as it's typed is, if the baseline impedance is low and you don't trust the automated automatic analysis, What's the best way to analyze it then? I guess manually would be the uh, 
Well, uh, the baseline impedance is very easy to measure. You just put the ruler, select the region you are trying to measure, and you read the values on the left side of the uh, screen. You don't need the automatic analysis for that. In the past, the first description of the baseline impedance required to take three short periods during the night and make an average of these three periods. So you needed to go and search for them. But we um, um, designed this method of measuring the whole supine period. And we look at the correlation with the previous method, and it's extremely good. So I think that the analysis of baseline impedance, you don't need the, um, the software automatic for that. You can do it manually in one second. Then the, the idea that you trust or you don't trust the software analysis is, is not just a matter of uh, trust. It's a matter that you want to know. You, you, can, you, you want to know more or less about the, uh, the study of your patient. It's up to you. If you are happy with the report of the software automatic analysis, it's up to you. I prefer to do it manually, personally. I uh, believe that the software many times is over-diagnosing reflux episodes, and I want to make sure that I am doing the precise analysis. I agree that pushing a button and getting the report in one in, in half a second, half a minute, is much more easy and comfortable than spending half an hour or three quarters of an hour of uh, editing the tracing. In my group and my people, we do it manually. We prefer to edit the automatic analysis. Uh, another question uh, regarding the low baseline impedance, Prof, is with the last study which showed the low baseline impedance where there was no acid reflux exposure despite the low impedance, was this study done on PPIs? The study was done off PPIs because you can see acid reflux episodes during daytime. If the study was done on PPIs, you couldn't see that. So the study was done off PPIs and the baseline impedance is very low in spite of the absence of acid reflux, suggesting that the mucosa is sick. And as I said, the low baseline impedance all over the esophagus, up to the proximal esophagus, is very typical of eosinophilic esophagitis. Right, next question, Rob. Um, what does it mean when there is a clear reflux event with a drop in esophageal pH, but a high gastric pH? This is a very good question. The, Thank you. I, it, 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 this question needs to understand the physiology of the concept of acid pocket. You know that uh, in the stomach, when you eat, the meal buffers the gastric contents and the pH immediately after the meal becomes five or six due to the presence of the meal. However, immediately below the lower esophageal sphincter, there is a region that is not affected by the buffering effect of the meal, a couple of centimeters immediately below the sphincter. This is what is now known as the acid pocket. It's a region that remains acidic. Now, when you put the pH probe in the stomach, you put it in the middle of the stomach, and it is reflecting the buffering effect of the meal, but not the acid pocket. So you can have a pH, gastric pH of six and have an acid reflux episode that is coming from this acid pocket. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Prof. Uh, uh, there's a question, Prof, asking, what's the treatment, what treatment do you offer for patients with rumination supergastric belching from Dr. Chowdhury? What what treatment do you give for ruminations, uh, comma, supergastric belching? Well, these are two different conditions. Um, for supergastric belching, we use 
uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that involves diaphragmatic breathing and involves a series of um, meetings with the patient where we explain the physiology of the problem and we teach them how to practice diaphragmatic breathing and there is a special position of the mouth and the tongue behind the upper teeth and this is the cognitive behavioral therapy for supragastric belching and that can be also supplemented with low doses of baclofen concerning rumination the treatment is more focusing on the abdominal wall and using uh, relaxant techniques for the abdominal wall and also diaphragmatic breathing but there is no need for baclofen or for mouth position uh, Prof, there's a question about the uh, how many symptoms are classified as significant in order to analyze SAP and SI? So how many symptoms? We use a cutoff of three. With less than three symptoms, we don't do the analysis. Three, cutoff of three. Thank three you. of the same type, three times herbal, not one herbal, one regurgitation and one chest pain. Three of the same type as a minimum criteria to make able to be able to do the symptom index or SAP. Uh, well, I think there's just one remaining question now. Um, how would you analyze a trace where the patient reports both heartburn and vomit? I don't understand very well uh, the question. Right. Can you repeat it? How would you analyze a trace where the patient reports both heartburn and vomit? I'm not sure if the attendee is still on board that can clarify what their question is. No, I think that the analysis of the tracing objectively about the total number of reflux episodes, acid exposure, baseline impedance is independent of the type of symptom. The question is whether the symptom um, whether the, the, the pH drops are due to reflux episodes or real vomiting. The, sometimes vomit, the product that comes up is acidic. Mm -hmm. and you cannot see from the uh, reflux recording whether this is a true reflux episode or a repetitive vomiting. I cannot know that unless uh, there is a a very clear marking of the patient every time that he vomits he marks and then i can see that the ph drops are related to this vomit events in that case i say all right these ph drops are due to vomit and not to reflux the treatment is the treatment of the vomit not of the reflux disease thank you prof uh another question sorry there's more questions coming in uh if someone has gastric belching precipitating uh reflux refractory to PPI medication, what is your approach? Well, I think that first thing we need to know whether the patient has significant aerophagia. Gastric belching is in general secondary to aerophagia. So one possibility is to treat the aerophagia as I explained with diet modifications and positioning. And also these belches are occurring always during transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. So sometimes it's useful to associate baclofen, that is a drug that reduces transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. However, baclofen can have oh, second I mean, many patients is not well tolerated. So I think we have the one final question, Tracy. Yes, one final question. Um, when you see the pathogenomic pattern for eosinophilic esophagitis, do you rely on that alone? Do you still need to do biopsies or do you just start treatment? And what is the specificity of this impedance as a test for EO? Well, no, uh, there are two situations. One situation is that the patient has symptoms, got an endoscopy, the endoscopy is um, not very clear and they were not taken biopsies 
and then they ask us reflux monitoring and we see this pattern of eosinophilic esophagitis so we write in our report that the patient needs to be re-endoscoped and taken biopsies to confirm the diagnosis of EOE. Another situation is that the patient never had an endoscopy and they send the patient for reflux monitoring, which is very uncommon. In general, most of the patients had ref uh, endoscopy before. No, I don't think that we can start any treatment of EOE without biopsies confirming the diagnosis. It's just a pattern that we discovered and needs to be uh, an alarm for the referring doctor. If he did not have the diagnosis previously of EOE, he needs to go do an endoscopy, take biopsies and start the treatment. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, so with that, that's the final question. And on behalf of uh, Synetics Medical UK and the Chongqing Jinsan Science and Technology Group. I'd like to thank Professor Zifrim today for the presentation and answering everybody's uh, questions. We've had a lot of positive feedback. The webinar will be available uh, on the internet and we will send a link uh, to everyone to be able to download it after the event. So thanks very much, Prof. And All right, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to do this. I enjoy it very much. Thank you to all the participants. I hope that this was useful for all of you. And um, you can always contact uh, Cinetics and, and they can forward me questions if you want. Have a good day, all of you, and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.